Hey there! I'm Sarah A. Chrisman, the author of the Tales of Chetsamoka, and today I'm going to talk to you about the classical world's influence on the Victorians. There's a scene in Love Will Find a Wheel, book two of the tales of Chetsamoka, where Jacob loans Addie a copy of Thomas Bullfinch's The Age of Fable, or Stories of Gods and Heroes. Jacob compares Addie to Psyche, the mortal so beautiful that Cupid himself fell in love with her, and the great goddess Venus was driven to jealousy. Addie shows Jacob the parlor ceiling she's painted with mythological constellations from her father's stories, and their shared love of the classics becomes a part of their own romance. Later, in book four of the Tales of Chetsamoka, Delivery Delayed, when Lizzie expresses disapproval of what she calls pagan yarns, Addie simply raises an eyebrow and asks schoolteacher Lizzie, Are you saying you disapprove of a classical education, Miss Bray? Lizzie is embarrassed by Addie's gentle admonition, and well she might be. At the time the story takes place, a good grounding in the classics was considered essential to a cultural education. The Western world owes a tremendous cultural debt to classical civilization, and educated people have long appreciated this. Ancient works such as the Iliad and the Odyssey are cornerstones of our literary canon. Our very language is full of classical references. In ancient Greek, a museum was a temple to the muses. And when modern English speakers sing hymns in church, they may or may not know that the word hymn itself comes from the ancient Greek word for an ode in praise of a god or hero. In the 1700s, archaeological explorations of the sites at Pompeii and Herculaneum led to a surge in interest in ancient Rome, especially after celebrities like the poet Goethe visited the sites. This revived interest in ancient Rome led to a corresponding interest in ancient Greece. This kept building, and in the 19th century, American interest in Greece was further piqued by news of the Greek Revolution, coming as it did not, long, not too long after our own Revolutionary War. Banks and government buildings adopted a neoclassical style of architecture inspired by the ancient temples, and interest in the classical world found expression throughout many different aspects of life. Statues modeled on ancient styles represented ideals like liberty and justice and books like Thomas Bullfinch's mythology made ancient stories accessible to common people. Some notables took things even further. Philosopher John Ruskin's book, The Queen of the Air, written in 1869, discusses how Athena, goddess of wisdom, remained relevant to modern life in the 19th century. Through the lens of Greek mythology, Ruskin discussed values that were very dear to Victorian hearts, from the sacred nature of home, to the virtues of beauty. Sometimes people emphasized the relevance of the classical world and its connection to their own time by combining imagery from the two. For example, images of Chief Chetsamoka and his family peer out from the acanthus leaves on the classical pillars of the Port Townsend Post Office, showing the importance of both new allies and old traditions. Classical themes appear throughout Victorian art, and that applies to both high and low art. A visitor to an art museum, <laughs> there's that word again, uh, but as I was saying, a visitor to a museum might see scenes of the classical world presented in great paintings, like the works of Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema. When they left the gallery, people would see imagery inspired by the classical world on even the most common of things. From a model in a bicycle advertisement who wears a Greek-inspired garment and holds the classic laurel wreath of victory, to a corset advertisement featuring a bust wearing the crescent moon crown of the goddess Artemis, there was no getting away from classical imagery. It was everywhere. One of the Victorian era's greatest homages to the classical worlds can still be seen today. In Nashville, Tennessee, USA, a full-sized replica of the Parthenon was built for the city's 1897 Centennial Exposition. 
This recreation of the jewel in the crown of the classical world stands as an enduring link, not just to our own Victorian forebears who built it, but also to the classical predecessors they admired. In the late 20th century, an enormous statue of the goddess Athena was added, having been replicated from ancient descriptions. Now, if you look very closely, you can spot tiny little me down there at the bottom of this picture, which should give you a sense of the scale and how huge the statue is. I'm five feet nine inches tall, or about 176 centimeters to those of you in the metric world. And I was wearing high-heeled button boots that day when this picture was taken. So in the picture, I was probably closer to 5'11", or 180 centimeters. Now, in her hand, the statue of Athena is holding a smaller statue of Nike, the goddess of victory. That little statue itself is taller than I am. Not all classical imagery is presented in quite so grandiose a manner. Some people's admiration for the classical world is expressed not in public buildings open to anyone, but in private homes sacred to the families who live in them. The home of famous Victorian orator Frederick Douglass had neoclassical influences, and they also appear in the homes of far humbler personages. But it's not all about architecture, not by a long shot. It's not even all about statues and fountains, although there were a lot of those. Classical images appear on things as small yet enduring as ladies' chatelaines from the 19th century. And sometimes the stamp of antiquity appeared in ways that weren't physical at all. In Victorian novels and plays, the characters sometimes call out exclamations like, by Jupiter, and figures from the classical world are evoked as descriptions, such as when a large but beautiful woman is described as Juno-esque, from Juno, the Roman ver version of Hera, queen of the gods. When a woman is described as Juno-esque, and it's usually a large woman who's described that way, She's being likened to the queen of the gods. It's a wonderful compliment. One of my favorite examples of classical mythology's influence on the Victorian world is Florence Nightingale's pet owl, Athena. If you haven't already watched my video from April 20th, 2020, about this wee beastie who inspired Ethel's pet owl in my Tales of Chetsumoka, you really should watch it. It's an adorable true story. In Greek mythology, the three fates are the spinners and weavers of human destiny. In a way, all the strands of time can be seen as a woven tapestry. Some strong threads in that tapestry have been woven into human lives for thousands of years, and they'll continue weaving the past into human destinies far into the future. The art, architecture, and stories of the classical world are key strands in that tapestry which weave our own lives together with all the many generations that have come before us as well as those who will come after us when we ourselves have passed into the pages of history. So I hope you all have a little better appreciation for the great debt we all owe the classical world and the importance that the Victorians placed on it. Thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a nice thumbs up and remember to tell your friends about my books. Happy reading!